Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Very good evening to you. Welcome to Health Matters. I'm Khawa Solomon, and today we talk about vaccinations and also how you can have a good trip when you're traveling abroad and knowing sort of the medical questions that you need to ask and know about before you do take your travels. So with me in the next hour, remember you can email us. Unfortunately, our lines are down, but do connect with us via email and our WhatsApp line and make it attention to Health Matters. So in studio, we have a nursing sister who's been in the travel clinic industry for a while, as well as Dr. Lorna. A very good day to Fiona and Dr. Lorna. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Evening. Thank you. Good evening. It's a really hot evening here in Johannesburg. Hope you are keeping yourselves nice and cool and calm <laughs> in this hot weather. Okay, so a hot topic indeed, vaccinations, is something that often comes up all the time. It's never sort of an ended um uh, you know, answer to it, and I think with vaccination also evolving as well, um, as more as much as you can know, you need to know. But we're not going to go into much detail. This is more about traveling. So travel vaccinations, as well as sort of you know healthy tips that you need to know when you are taking your trip. So let's start with you, uh, Dr. Lorna. Tell us a bit about yourself and what you do exactly. Okay. Um... My name is Lorna, I'm a family physician. I work at Parkmore Medical Centre, which um, is a centre that comprises of Santon Travel Clinic and family physicians as a medical practice. Okay. And I work there seeing travel travellers as well as general patients from children to the elderly. Great stuff. And apparently our nursing sister in studio who has been around in the travelling clinic for quite a bit, uh, Fiona McDuff, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I've been at the practice for 17 years, sure. uh, doing general nursing tasks, doing reception, and then in 2009, they decided to start the Santon Travel Clinic, mm. and I was lucky to be involved in the start of it and the running of it. Okay, so let's get off with our questions indeed. Unfortunately, um, those questions from our viewers, we'll just have to wait a little bit. We'll bank them and uh, hopefully we will get back to them. But tell us about vaccines, vaccinations. Are they proven to work? Definitely. Um, nothing is 100% effective. Mm. Um, but over the years, with the advent of vaccines, many um, diseases have been controlled mm -hmm. and some have even been eradicated. There's been a distinct decline in the number of cases of children being hospitalised and even dying from vaccine-preventable diseases there is a, def a definite need for it. Yes. And a must. Because yes. I know that even when you're applying for a school, the teachers, the principals, the admin staff wants to see your child's vaccination card. That's um, we don't want to know what happens if there isn't one, <laughs> but yeah, you have to have one. Uh, when are vaccinations needed? Well, there's a childhood schedule, mm -hmm. which starts from birth and right up to about two years. Then there's the school going age, the teenage ones, and then you get your ones for travelers you get your ones for your um, chronic illness sufferers, they need things like Prevenar, okay. and then your older person also needs the Prevenar and um, things like Zostavax. Mm. And then there are special cases like traveling to Mecca, it's important, well, it's um, mandatory, you have yeah, yellow you fever mm. and meningitis. And now for people traveling to Australia to see newborn babies, they have to have the tetanus, diphtheria, whooping cough, polio vaccine okay. because they are trying to protect the newborns from the whooping cough. Mm. And pregnant women between um, 27 weeks and 37, uh, 36 weeks of pregnancy are encouraged to have the same vaccine to protect their newborn babies. Yeah, in South Africa? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so mm. when was that initiated? That's probably about two years ago it okay. started to come in. Because I can't remember having it with my last baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a new one. But so, so what exactly do vaccines do for us? Um, they developed from um, often microbes or viruses that have been killed. Um, and some of them are live um, vaccines. Mm. And they're injected into the body. The body recognizes them as a foreign object. 
and immediately starts building up antibodies mm. and therefore the body then remembers that um, virus mm. and the next time it comes into contact with it it can protect against okay. it. When traveling are there sort of vaccinations that's not mandatory that you maybe suggest you know travelers have? Yes, um, there are. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, there are mandatory ones, yeah. um, but uh, including the yellow fever, that's the big one in, in Africa. But um, there are other vaccines that we offer adults, um, and they are often the vaccines that they had as a child, okay. but the immunity declines with age. So often we re-offer um, the tetanus uh, vaccine, mm -hmm. and we re-offer the... Um, diphtheria, pertussis, polio um, and um, vaccine. Uh, if patients are traveling to areas where there is a high risk of typhoid disease, mm. which is a food and waterborne illness causing um, a very bad diarrheal disease, um, that we would also vaccinate them against typhoid. Okay. Um, so yeah. one thing didn't come up, and I know it's not exactly a vaccine, but there's that flu injection that people would want to get during the winter. Tell us about that and the difference between that and a vaccine. No, so the flu vaccine is absolutely a vaccine. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's an inactivated influenza virus mm -hmm. that is um, uh, remade every year as the flu strains wow. change. Okay. So th that vaccine needs to be administered um, before the winter starts and um, it needs to be readministered every year as the, the, the vaccine changes with the viral strains. So you said just as the flu vaccine needs to be given just before winter because you want to not get that bout of terrible flu, um, is it true that it keeps the flu away and also with the other vaccines does it also keep the, that sort of um, polio or disease away specifically? So it's quite a tricky one and yeah. patients often ask that, um, why did I get sick if I had the flu vaccine? Mm. And the answer is that the flu vaccine um, covers three strains of the influenza virus, A, B and H1N1 or the swine flu. Mm. The, but there are many other pathogens or viruses that cause respiratory tract infections. Okay. So um, we can cover you for the flu, the real flu, the, the influenza A, B and H1N1 with the vaccine, but mm. um, there are many other bugs out there and, and people can still, um, they're still Get affected because of that, yeah. Okay, so it's just a sort of precautionary me measure because I've heard often people say, no, but you didn't get it as bad as what you would have gotten it. Is that true? It's more likely a okay. different strain, strain of the virus. Okay, yeah. um, any comments from you, Fiona, with regards to flus? Oh, well, I, I think it is a very important vaccine mm. for any age group, from little ones right up to the elderly. Mm. And there's never a, you know, people say, when should I have it in winter? Mm. You can have it at the start, you can have it at the middle, you can have it at the end. It is better to have it th at the start, but it's never too late to have it. Okay. As long as the vaccine is available, have it. All right, so that's also another big question. When should you have your vaccines? Um, I know specifically winter, you're saying before, preferably, mm. but it's okay to have in between as well. The other vaccines, is there a specific time, age? Um, do you have to be healthy? I mean, in the sense that you don't have the flu or you're not sick to be having your, your vaccines when traveling? So we do advise people who are traveling mm. to consider their um, travel clinic appointments um, as a priority. Okay. And ideally, if they could have it six weeks even before they go. The, travel, okay. um, the reason being is a lot of the, the vaccines take um, a minimum of 10 days to become, to have elicited the immune response that mm. we want. So um, we want people to have them well in advance of their trip, not, not last minute mm. um, for, for it to be Does it often happen? Oh, I forgot Definitely. I need to have my vaccines. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, okay. we do, we do um, advise people to, to oh, nice. have it well in advance. Do you think it's something that, um, I'm not just sure whether it's your uh, travel sort of consultant or guide that are advising, is, is it any sort of um, advice that they are given when they are, um, you know, booking people to travel overseas? A, a lot of, are you meaning the travel agents as Yes, such? sorry, yeah. the travel agents. Yeah. Many of them are giving misinformation, mm. especially where it um, involves the yellow fever vaccine. Okay. They're not 100% sure of which countries require it. Okay. 
Um, but at least they are getting people to come to travel clinics, mm -hmm. which is the most important thing. Okay. I'd rather they gave them a little bit of misinformation mm -hmm. about the yellow fever, then said, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. And this poor person goes off to wherever. Nigeria or wherever, mm -hmm. and they don't have their yellow fever vaccine. Are they turned around if that is the case? Legally, they can be. Okay. Um, there have been cases of them being sent back but we don't always get feedback on that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody really wants to, to put out the bad news yeah. <laughs> of vaccines. Okay, so, um, all right, so vaccinations that uh, travelers need to get when a travel a sort of agent is involved, um, you, you're saying that 100% definitely visit your travel advisor um, or medical yeah. advisor yeah. to just double check. Yeah. Definitely. We would definitely recommend that. And, mm -hmm. and then we start the conversation of, um, are your other vaccinations up to date? And um, we start exploring things like, um, you know, malaria prevention and prevention of travellers' diarrhoea. Mm -hmm. We can give lots of extra information um, okay. if they come to a consult. So we're definitely going to go into detail with regards to that. We also will be talking about vaccinations when it comes to children, when children travel or whether they are a resident here in South Africa. Um, the, uh, of course, the clinics is the first port of call. Would uh, general practitioners also offer vaccinations or are they usually for little ones or are they referred to, to clinics firstly, the government clinics? What, no. are, what are sort of, okay? We, we give the children's vaccines. Okay. Um, unfortunately, vaccines can be costly because all of them are imported. Mm -hmm. So a lot of parents will rather go to the government clinics, um, but we see a lot of children for their vaccines. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So we'll talk more on vaccinations, the children, the tricky question, should they vaccinate or not? Our uh, physician, uh, specialist phys physician is in studio with us as well as our specialist nursing sister within the travel clinic is in studio. Please do stay with us on this episode of Health Matters. Back in a moment. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. A very good evening. This is Health Matters and we have our tra travel clinic in studio with us. This time of year, everybody's going for some sort of holiday, um, whether it is just to the other side of the country or abroad um, or even traveling on Umrah. They have some important health tips for you, medical health tips for you. We have a specialist nursing sister in the travel clinic as well as a physician, a family physician, a Dr. Fiona and, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Lorna and Fiona. Welcome back, guys. Thank okay, you. so Fiona, you've mentioned earlier on that um, you know they are quite expensive. And my first question was because I remember back when my kids went for the measles, mums, and rubella, and I was like, oh my goodness, it's almost five hundred rand. So why are they so expensive? All the vaccines that we are using are imported, mm. um, and with the way the rand is at the moment, it just increases more and more. Okay. Um, and many of them are new vaccines, um, and they're still covering their patents and those and their trials. So they are more expensive. Okay. So when you say expensive, what are vaccines costing our travellers? Sure. We're looking at about for the pneumococcal vaccine, mm. it's about nine hundred rand, um, and for the. Uh, the one for the herpes zoster for your shingles, that's also about a thousand rand. Cholera at the moment for the two doses that you need is about two thousand rand. Sure. So it does get costly yeah. for these. Tra the yellow fever um, is just over four hundred rand. Four hundred and the malaria. That's a difficult one to give a price on okay. because it depends on, we have to check the medical history to okay. decide which one is best because they mm. all have different side effects. You're taking them for different lengths of time. And so we have to discuss it with the person. Absolutely. So that's another sort of um, uh, bulk of questions that we mm. need, get, yeah. need to get into. <laughs> eh? But quickly, on, on the travel side, so specifically when people come in for consultation, what is sort of the port of call that you sort of follow, a doctor, um, and what should we as patients know to ask? 
Okay, so we, we go through a, a list of things. Mm. Um, the first question everybody wants to know is about vaccinations. And um, we hear sort of where they're going to, for how long, mm. what kind of accommodation they're staying in. Um, and then we consult a travel website that we use called Travax, which gives us an up-to-date um, recommendations for the countries worldwide. Okay. Um, and then we will discuss vaccinations that they need mm -hmm. and vaccinations that they may need or may want um, in addition. Following that, um, we will cover the malaria question, whether they're traveling to a malaria area. And um, if it is a high risk for malaria, we will discuss um, malaria prevention um, medication as well as insect bite avoidance um, measures, including, you know, your, your um, insect repellents and your clothing and your mosquito nets. Um, then we would also um, discuss with the patient if they had any chronic, we would know, uh, find out if they had any chronic illnesses okay. and whether they were um, adequately prepared for their trip in terms of having enough medication. Do they need a letter from the doctor explaining mm -hmm. Um, why, they have this. why they have this medication, mm. maybe a, a list of their medications, um, should they run into any kind of trouble overseas um, and that they can get some help. Um, what else? We also discuss travel insurance um, and we do recommend travel insurance um, and that that's a, another topic on its mm. own. Um, what else do we discuss with our patients? Well, then if they need altitude sickness oh, yes. tablets mm. there's a lot of people go and climb, climb. Kilimanjaro sure. and they need something to help them through altitude sickness okay. so that is discussed and we advise them how to deal with the change in altitude um, like what are they asking you besides the vaccines when they when you recommend the vaccines what are the questions that come out so there? a lot of a lot of the questions come out of the discussion of the vaccines yeah. for example if I say I would recommend you're going to a uh, parts of India mm. where maybe there's typhoid fever yes. and then the questions will come out well what is typhoid how do I get it what are my risks of getting yeah, it do I need the stuff, vaccine yeah. mm. um, and then that leads to discussion about food and waterborne illnesses how to prevent them um, how to to um, you know purify your water frequent hand washing mm. all those kind of things so it's quite a lengthy consultation mm. we do allow 30 minutes yes. um, Per, per travel consult because there's a lot of questions. And then often the question have. doesn't always, always come up there and then. They go back home and say, oh gosh, I, need, I wanted to ask the doctor this or this yeah. or that. So this is why we give them a handout um, okay. about insect avoidance mm -hmm. um, and water precautions and things like that because we can sit and talk to them mm. And they'll probably forget half yeah. of it. So yeah. we either email them the information That's or give them a, a handout and they can read it at their leisure. Yeah. Okay. So, so my big question as well, when it comes to people coming into your clinic, I'm sure it's voluntary. Mm. And um, as you said, the, the uh, travel agents doesn't necessarily always sort of... Um, you know, um, advertise the fact that they need to go and, you know, and make it sound as pressing. Mm -hmm. um, but is it an important sort of uh, tick to check off on your list when traveling? I think it really depends where you're going. Okay. Um, you know, I don't see many people coming saying we're going to Europe on a planned, you know, Contiki tour, okay. or I'm going to England to visit London. Mm. We don't really see people with, with that kind okay. of issue. It's often people traveling into African countries, mm -hmm. um, Asian countries, India um, and Far East Asia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we see um, some uh, Muslim um, patients coming in, maybe going to Mecca for the, um, pilgrimage. the, the pilgrimage. Um, patients going to South America. So they've kind of had a bit of a heads up from someone okay. that they need to look into um, infectious diseases that they could get while traveling. Yeah. All right. So, so some of the um, tips that you can give us when it comes to vaccinations that are not available, because I remember um, one of my little ones needed to wait for one of her vaccinations. And, I, and, it, and your clinic card states specifically, you know, you have mm. to have it at this month and that month and, and, and little babies get vaccinations every month. Just explain that, you know, why every month? Why are they getting vaccinations every month at that specific time? Um, because when there aren't vaccinations, they can't get it at that time. Mm. 
I think maybe if you can deal with this one, because you know <laughs> the you know why it's those gaps. Mm. I'll, why are they that yeah. important? So vaccinations in children, in infancy and in children, are mm. very important. Um, okay. We. I think we um, try our very best, mm. um, I'm sure the government tries its very best to have stock of all the um, essential compulsory vaccines. Um, they have, and, and these are scheduled at a very um, careful time in a child's life. Okay. Um, you know, starting from birth to six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, mm. um, nine months, 12 months. Um, which is at a, a, a rate that the child can handle. Um, and, it's also, it, it, and it's also um, the sp spaced apart so that the child's immune system can begin to build res um, antibody responses to okay. these vaccines. So that four week um, uh, time interval is very important in mm. the beginning. If we do not have a vaccine, um, in terms of the, the compulsory expanded um, program of immunization for children in South Africa, we have everything in stock. The one that we have a difficulty with at the moment is hepatitis A, which is a, um, a voluntary vaccine okay. and um, is often one we also offer to, offer to travelers mm -hmm. to prevent hepatitis A infection. Um, unfortunately, there is a nationwide shortage of that at the moment and we, we can't give it. Obviously, we can't give it and we take people's names or put them on a waiting list. And you list. have to wait for it to come from wherever, not in South Africa. It's, it's, it's important. Overseas. And important. Fiona um, says that uh, we should expect stock in February 2019. Okay, so you've so, got a long waiting list there, hey, Fiona. Mm, yes. <laughs> All right, so, so what happens then in the case where they're not getting these vaccines? What do they need to take? Is there a tablet they must, you know, that they can take with them? What advice are you giving them if they do? Are, are that, you know, sort of concerned about getting hepatitis? Um, well, at least the hepatitis A is something that we can offer sort of general precautions against. Okay. Um, but there are more severe um, diseases that mm. that are um, very serious okay. if, if contracted. Um, I haven't yet had the experience of having one of those out of stock in, mm. a, in a facility where I worked. Um, have you? Yeah, we've been through quite a few um, where we haven't been able to get the different um, vaccines. Mm. For a while we couldn't get the chickenpox vaccine. Okay. So there again, the children had to wait for that. Um, and that's the hepatitis A. I'm trying to, for a while, I think we were battling to get hepatitis B. Mm. You know, and it's not just one company mm. importing. Okay. So it is a problem overseas that we're battling with. Nationwide, uh, worldwide. Low, worldwide, okay. worldwide, yes. <laughs> low stock and hepatitis, is it A? a? Hepatitis yes. A, yeah. Okay. So, so any advice that you then leave the, the patient with? Just be very, very cautious of your food and water. Mm. It, you know, there's nothing else to replace that vaccine. It's okay. not as though we can give them an antibiotic or mm. anything like that. Mm. Just be cautious. Or a booster or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, after leaving, you know, sort of the, the clinic with the necessary vaccines, is there any advice that you give to the patient? Like, okay, you cannot drink milk now for the next mm. 24 hours. I mean, that's just something mm. off the top of my head. But yeah, is there anything precautionary? So we do um, uh, advise people that they, they may have um, minor side effects okay. like um, pain and swelling at the injection site. Right. Um, that's a very mild side effect. Mm. There are more serious ones which particularly come with the vaccines that are live vaccines. So there's two kinds of vaccines uh, that fall into either a group of live vaccines mm -hmm and a group of inactivated okay. vaccines. So the live vaccines is where there's actually a, um, a component, a small component of the live virus or bacteria that is in the vaccine. Mm. And the potential there is that the patient may develop a mild form of the illness in about 10 days time. Okay. Um, so that is, the, the live vaccines are only a few. It's the um, MMR, mm. measles, mumps, rubella. It's yellow fever. Um, it's chicken pox and it's the shingles vaccine. Okay. So those patients, we maybe just give a little bit more of an alert that mm. there may be a, a bit of a, a, a reaction 
which doesn't happen with everybody. And I'm but sure everybody has a reaction when they, they know it's coming. News. But um, yeah. Okay. So we quickly need to pay the bills. When we get back, we talk more on traveling. That we have travel clinic specialist in studio with us, uh, specialist physician as well as nursing sister. Stay with us more after this short break. Asalaamu As Alaikum and welcome back. Travelling, vaccinations, that's the topic of discussion on Health Matters this evening. Please do interact via our Facebook page, ITV Networks. And also, if you've missed any of our shows, follow the YouTube channel, um, Health Matters, ITVNetworks.tv, as well as our uh, email address you can communicate with us and our WhatsApp line, which is uh, quite interesting. Every morning you get an inspirational message. So in studio, we have a specialist physician in studio with us, so Dr. Lorna and Fiona, our nursing clinic, who's been around at the clinic since 2009, so uh, 17 years, wow. Okay, so vaccinations, we started a bit, uh, you know, with children and, you know, why they why do we vaccinate and we got, in got into adults that leave the clinic and sometimes they do get a bit of a bug. Um, so looking back at the questions down, um, around the, um, uh, the children, you know, and sort of trying to prevent this disease. Um, at the end of the day, like we mentioned with the flu, that we're getting it and yeah, you know what, you're not getting the flu as bad and sometimes you don't even get the flu at all. So looking at some of the vaccinations or sort of the immunizations, can they cause anything sort of bad in the body, like allergies or a reaction of some sort? Um, does that does it happen? Is, is it possible? So. Um, vaccines are um, made from a purified protein, mm -hmm. part of the virus or bacteria that, that they're um, aiming to prevent. Um, and, and therefore they can induce an allergic response. Okay. In some people who have the genetic predisposition, um, they, they can be, like you can become allergic to eggs or chicken okay. or milk. It's a protein that you could become allergic to that vaccine. Mm -hmm. The vaccines do not overall cause allergies, okay. you know, um, they're not going to cause asthma, they're not going to cause hay fever, um, but you could have a reaction to a particular vaccine. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, um, it's obviously fundamental that you report it immediately um, to your local um, healthcare provider. And um, often you'll be given a course of uh, antihistamines or corticosteroids um, to deal with the allergy mm. and then also noted that you are not to receive that vaccine again. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so would that sort of been on your allergy list? <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, okay. if I maybe had an allergic response to a meningitis vaccine, mm. that must always be documented you mean, in, in, in my history, file. In history, like, yeah. you know, allergic to peanuts, that's one thing Absolutely. on my list, I'm allergic to the vaccine, I yeah. have a reaction. But it is a very rare occurrence, okay. mm. yeah. So, are there any sort of cases when a child is given several immunizations, a child or even an adult, and they needed these vaccines, that the body has overreacted or has reacted to it and you know maybe become overwhelmed the child's immune system or something does that happen so um no it doesn't okay. um vaccines have been through rigorous um safety um measures um for years and years and years mm. and um it is very safe to give children a, a combination of vaccines at the same time okay. um we the only thing is that with the interval between is, is important that we just um, honor that. Mm. But it is safe. Um, there is not a, um, a addition of side effects. They don't um, sort of have more side effects. Mm. Um, it is safe and a child's immune system can manage. manage. Yeah. Okay. So going back to getting a reaction with the vaccine, as you said, sometimes you are actually affected by that virus a um, little bit, maybe after 10 days. What should you do, you know, if that happens? You have, of course, spoken to your patient to mm -hmm. say, there's a possibility, this and that, and, you know. So should they go come back to your clinic? Should they phone a GP or should they just like let it sort of work through their system? I think if the patient has been really informed mm -hmm. um, and the symptoms that they're experiencing are exactly uh, what we have um, mentioned, mm -hmm. headaches, mild fever, maybe a bit of body aches or just feeling under the weather, mm. um, they, they can just sit that out okay. um, with, with plenty of fluids and maybe some um, 
pain relieving uh, medication. Mm. Um, if it is anything beyond what they expected, um, then then they should consult us. Okay. Yeah. And and with you, Fiona, are there any sort of questions that um, or fears that patients do come in? Um, that they have questions about and how would you sort of subside all of that? Uh, well, there's so many patients who have horrendous needle phobia. Okay. <laughs> and That's just not with vaccinations. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you yeah. just talk them through it, explain mm -hmm. to them, and I find just keeping them talking distracts them from that. Okay. So that's the one fear that we deal with. The other one is that they think they're going to get side effects. Okay. And you talk them through that, explain the possible side effects. They are often the ones who will phone about seven to ten days later and say, mm -hmm. this, this and this, you know, I've got this fever, I've got this um, sore arm. Mm -hmm. And we just talk them through and they're usually happy with that. They've been reassured that it's nothing unusual and then they're happy. Okay, so is there a difference between vaccines and boosters? Um... Well, we usually talk about vaccines as the primary um, vaccination. Mm -hmm. The first, maybe it's a series, maybe it's okay. one, two, and three, or maybe it's just once off. Mm -hmm. um, and then we talk about the booster being uh, the thing that the the next vaccine that they may need of the same thing, okay. maybe in seven or ten years' time. Mm -hmm. And it's a booster is sort of a reminder to the body's immune system that you have been exposed to this. Um, antigen or virus before mm. and, and build up your army of antibodies again. Okay, yeah. so is that the same thing like having your chicken box when you were a child and later on when you get to the doctor and they ask you, did you have chicken box? Did you have your vaccinations for mumps? And you just, just can't remember your childhood days or yeah. your boosters or your vaccines. What happens in those cases? <sighs> So that's very common. Most yeah. adults don't remember what they had as a child. Well, they know that they had all the normal things, yes. but they may not remember, did I have a tetanus again? Or yeah. did I get that? A lot of people can't remember. And, and then we, we just have to kind of go with, well, what is their risk now? Okay. Are they traveling? Mm. Are they working in an industry where they're exposed to, mm. um, you know, lots of people with flu or, or whatever? Healthcare workers are, in, are an example. Um, and okay. then we would offer them boosters. Okay. And it certainly doesn't do them any harm, even if they had one had as one. a child, yeah. to repeat it. Yeah. Um, the body just builds up more antibodies, so okay. you're actually safer. So, so tell me about that injection that all of us as a, as a child got, and it left that horrible little circle on our, I can't remember which arm it was. The right arm. The right <laughs> arm. And um, if you didn't see that on somebody, you would always get a bit worried. And it's like, oh, no, I did have it. It just went away. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what was that? And uh, everybody, f all children feared that. Eh? I think it was a few needles and they yeah. just punched you. <laughs> what this was that? The BCG. Okay. Oh. So that was even before my time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, that's to help protect against um, tuberculosis, okay. which is rife in Africa. Mm -hmm. And... It won't guarantee 100% protection, but should a child be exposed to tuberculosis, they will to have probably about an 80-90% protection, but it will decrease their chance of getting the very severe um, problems from the TB. Is it still given like that today? Yes. No. Uh, no. It's not the same form. No, it's it's a, just a one needle. <laughs> yeah. And because uh, we've got the marks. <laughs> yeah. No. So it's just one needle, and it's given at birth or the day okay. after birth. Um, still has quite a nasty little reaction. Mm, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. No, you weren't labelled to say. No. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about um, um, vaccinations and autism. So there's been this, this talk around, you know, I'm not going to vaccinate, vaccinate my child because I've read this up about um, the connection with autism. Let's just clear that up and, and, and talk about why and how this has come about. Okay. Um, so th the, the bottom line is that there is no link mm -hmm. between vaccinations um, and autism spectrum. Um, the way that this controversy came up is um, through a, um, a study that was published in 1998 
um, in the Lancet, a journal, by a man called Andrew Wakefield. Mm. And he conducted a study, um, a small study, um, which he um, published and said that there is an association between, particularly that he was studying the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, um, and he said there is an association between that vaccine and autism. Mm. After following that publication, um, obviously there was a big uproar and um, followed on, this is just a summary, 12 years of extensive research mm. and with multiple studies by multiple researchers and this disproved his, um, his theory. Oh, yes. Um, subsequently, so that in 2010, that paper was withdrawn from the Lancet, and the the um, the doctor was also asked to deregister from the the um, Health Council in the UK, um, and and following that, there has just been ongoing studies to looking for any kind of association between MMR and neuropsychological um, symptoms mm -hmm. or syndromes, um, and everything has been proved um, no association. I do want to refer anybody who's interested to a very um, comprehensive article by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is called Vaccine Safety, Examine the Evidence. And it is a beautifully written article with all the evidence right before you. So any worried parents mm. um, should read that and, and see the, the evidence for themselves. Um, but. As we stand at the moment, we have no fear of association between MMR, other vaccines, other vaccine preservatives, and autism. Okay, so you yeah. would say unequivocally, vaccines are safe and effective. Definitely. Unequivocally, yeah. Right. We'll leave uh, the listeners with that, uh, the viewers rather, with that statement. Absolutely great advice that we have in studio with us. We have a specialist travel clinic uh, doctor, physio, a specialist physician in studio with us and a nursing sister. So please do visit the uh, clinic, which is based in Santon. If you have any questions and if you are traveling, and as they said, they have uh, see regularly, uh, on a regular basis, they see your most uh, pilgrims P uh, pilgrimages, um, sorry, pilgrims leaving for pilgrimage um, to Mecca, as well as those traveling out in African countries. And of course, the advice that you give them is pivotal and they need to make the decision. Is there any sort of uh, outlook where people saying you would advise something and say, no, I'm not going to go for this? Would, would you still encourage them to go? But before you answer that question, let's take an ad break. We'll uh, talk more on travel, travel clinic here in studio on Health Matters this evening. Back in a moment. Assalamu alaikum, very good evening and welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us as we have the Travel Clinic in studio with us. They're based out in Sandton. We have a Dr. Fiona. <laughs> getting a drive every time. <laughs> Dr. Lorna, you should have badges. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Lorna, as well as Fiona, our nursing uh, sister in studio that's been with the clinic since 2009. And we've heard so in the break, we've heard some good news, which I'm also going to quickly scratch into. But um, quickly, with regards to vaccinations and boosters and um, going for it or not, and this is a question that comes back and forth even till today, where parents are choosing not to vaccinate their child, what would and I know we spoke about the fear of autism and the link and, and sort of issue around that. But what is, is that the main fear when it comes to why parents are not vaccinating and why some doctors are even also advising against immunizations? Um, so some parents are choosing to um, either delay immunizations, okay. delay the spacing. They feel the, the program is overcrowded and it's too much okay. um, for the children at once. Or um, So some parents are choosing to delay or not complete their vaccination schedule mm. um, out of fear of possible side effects, like we've discussed. Um, but then also they're ignoring the huge benefits that are, that are well-researched um, and, and the side effects have been well-researched themselves. Mm. So um, I, do, I advocate that all children should be having their um, recommended vaccinations um, set out by the, the, the Department of Health. Mm. Um, and then there's additional ones as well that they could be offered. 
the only time as a doctor when I would um, um, not suggest a patient being immunized is not actually in children. It's, it's later on in life. It's adults who maybe need um, boosters or they need, um, they're traveling and they need yellow fever or meningitis. Um, and in the, there's a certain patient, an immunocompromised patient, mm -hmm. which is a patient who has got a weakened immune system. Um, that can be a, a patient, patient with active cancer, a patient receiving chemotherapy, patients on um, prolonged corticosteroid therapy or immunosuppression, advanced HIV patients. Those patients have um, are already immunocompromised, mm -hmm. and this is certain those live vaccines that I talked about earlier. Those we would very cautious, cautious about giving to an immunocompromised patient. That is the only setting when I would say, let's hold back on vaccines. Mm. It's not the children. Um, and I, I believe if parents do their research, if they have a good discussion with their healthcare provider, that hopefully um, they will see that it, the, the, the huge importance mm. of preventing vaccine preventable deadly diseases. Absolutely. Yeah. So mm. now I'm going to throw another spanner in the works and this has come up with many sort of chronic illnesses where people are going for alternate therapy. Are there any alternate therapies for vaccines? Um, I can't imagine that there would be. Okay. Um, it's quite a specific science, yeah, science. And, uh, and vaccines have been through rigorous mm. trials mm. and testing um, to, to prevent a specific disease. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the alternative. Of any. All right. yeah. mm -hmm. So now I'm going to link it to the flu injection. Um, are sort of travelers coming to you and say, listen, I'm going to the UK. I know it's really cold there. I'm prone to get the flu. Um, I get it here, but I don't usually take, you know, the flu injection. Is this something that you would recommend to um, travelers that are going to your really cold areas? The problem is, um, the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere have a different flu season. Okay. So it is different viruses. Often there's that, you know, in the flu vaccine. Mm. Often they're similar, um, but there is often a difference. What we do advise, have our flu vaccine, okay. because you might be exposed to people on the flight with one of the viruses From and it will protect mm. you. And when you get to the Northern Hemisphere, you'll possibly be protected as well. Okay. But, or else we advise them, when you get to your destination, have one of the Northern Hemisphere These, okay. flu vi uh, vaccines. Okay, that's a very good idea. I yeah. never thought of that. Yeah. Okay, let's look at some of the, the new vaccines that are needed for the little ones. For kids, of course, this new, new school-going age, and if they've missed that, they can have it a little bit later. Talk to us about how, what that is, how important it is. Um, and then there's also one specifically for girls, young girls. Yeah, so... Um the new vaccines that you would be referring to um, recently, relatively recently, mm. um, would be the, that have been added to the, the EPI, um, would be the pneumococcal vaccine. The EPI being? The expanded okay. program of immunization. Okay. That government's um, standard, standard okay. mm. um, table that you've right. got to complete. Just checking. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, recently added ones. I don't know if you, are you mentioned, are you talking about pneumococcal or rotavirus? I'm not sure what it is. I just know, I checked my, my daughter's clinic card and she just had the seven-year-old um, okay. school-going one. Yes. But my boys missed it. So they said, okay, it can be repeated at nine or 12. I'm not sure it's the same one. Okay. And there was one specifically when I said, oh, okay, when she's nine, do that, do, uh, must I bring them as well? So they said, no, that one's just for the girls. So um, the school-going one at six or seven mm -hmm. is a... Um, a tetanus and a diphtheria okay. um, and it's a booster. They've had lots of these before. Right. It's a booster as they enter school. Um, and, and then the one you're talking about, the nine-year-old, that's the HPV vaccine, the human papilloma virus, which is the virus um, that is linked to cervical cancer okay. uh, later in life. And it's now recommended for girls um, at nine years old. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, depending on which one, there's either two or three. Um, so that's the first vaccine they're given? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do they get a booster again or a repeat? It's, uh, it's a course of three. Okay. The one brand, you give one, 
one two months later and one six months from the first one. Still within that nine year yes. age. Yeah. Okay. And then this other brand is one one month later and one six months later. Yeah. They're three. now saying that if they're given it under the age of 13, they only need the two doses. Mm. Over the age of 13, they need the three doses. And we also recommend it for boys. Okay. Boys can carry the HPV yeah. and pass it on to the girls. And so therefore, if we can prevent them carrying that virus, we're lessening the chance of the girls getting the virus. Okay. And it can be given up to the age of, for females to about the age of 28 or even older. Mm -hmm. You know, the guidelines say 28. And I think for males, it's up to the age of about 21. 28. So yeah. if you still, if one still has teenagers or kids at 21 years old, they can visit Let the travel clinic for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important vaccine because mm -hmm. it can okay. prevent cancer. Cancer. Yeah. There, there has been quite a heated debate mm -hmm. on social media, um, but we have not seen any problems with it. We haven't had any patients coming back and having the problems that are being an talked issue. about. Yeah. Okay, so ladies, we have two minutes to wrap up our, our travel clinic uh, segment for this evening. Just quickly, babies that are breastfed are given lots of antibodies. Why is all the concern with regards to having them vaccinated? Um, babies acquire antibodies, uh, maternal antibodies mm. from their, their mum, uh, primarily through breastfeeding. And um, but this is called passive immunity. Okay. So it's just the passing on of antibodies from mm. mum to baby, and it's a short-lived immunity. Okay. So within a few months, the babies need to be vaccinated so they build their own antibody response. Brilliant, brilliant yeah. answer. Okay, and any sort of advice that you'd like to give to our viewers that are traveling, um, whether they need any vaccines or not, or just some general tips on traveling? Oh, please visit your travel clinic. There we go. <laughs> Come to us with your itinerary so we can see if it's malaria areas or not. Mm. We'll advise you on your vaccines. If you have a vaccination card, bring it along. Brilliant. And have a wonderful holiday. <laughs> and Absolutely. wear sun cream. Sun oh, cream. That's yeah. a big one, hey? Yeah. And reapply them. Yeah. Yes. Later on in the day. Absolutely. And especially mm. with other swim. swim. There we go. S uh, swimming, ablution, take them with face, face, face. Yeah. 50 plus, hey? Yeah, 50 plus for your face. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, ladies, for your advice. I didn't see that one coming, the sunscreen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's an important one. Sometimes there isn't even UVA or UVB, um, but still the glare of, mm. you know, uh, uh, during the daytime, the sun mm. is hidden, I've heard. It mm. can still affect mm. you. So absolutely great advice given from our travel clinic based out in Santon. Thank you so much, ladies. It was a pleasure yeah. having you here. Thank you. And some important information. Hope you at home have definitely... Uh, uh, benefited from today's show remember that you have missed it and if you'd like to maybe let somebody know travel clinic was on health matters uh, please do follow our youtube link itvhealthmatters.tv from myself Hawa Salaman, wassalamu alaikum and goodbye for now